Uh, my name is Jamie, and I am going to be reading from 1 Peter 2, 11 through 17. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct, conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. This is the word of the Lord. Oh, good morning, church family. Morning. You know, it wasn't that long ago, maybe a few weeks ago, I was having a conversation with one of my uh, nephews, and uh, he was, uh, he's, he's married, and uh, you know, he's got his job, and he's working, and, and he was asked to do a project for somebody, and we were talking about the project that he was looking to do, and he said, Dave, he said, it was the strangest thing. He says, as I was doing this project for this other person, you know, I'm, I'm about ready to complete the project, when all of a sudden, this voice rang in my ears. And the voice said this, are you doing the job like I, your father, would do it? And, and I just laughed immediately because if you're a Wajniki man, you have grown up your entire life hearing that phrase. It was a phrase that my dad heard from his dad, and then my dad passed on to us, and that my brother passed on to, to his son. The idea that as you're doing something, engaging in something, are you doing it the way that you would do it, or are you doing it the way that I, your father, would want you to do it? It's this whole idea that as we were kids, we would be tasked with something to do. And as a child, you would look at a project that you were doing and you'd be like, eh, that's good enough for government work. You know what I'm saying? Like you would just look at something and, and we'd be like, that's, but then the voice would ring in our ears. Is that how dad would want me to do it? Is that how dad would have thought through? And then of course you spend a few more moments doing the thing and you do it the right way. And so my, my nephew, he's, he's in his 30s. He's like, even as a 30-year-old girl, my, my dad's voice is still ringing in my ears. And I share this with you because today, and really almost every Sunday, uh, what we want to do when we come to this place and study the Word of God is to hear what our Father has to say. That we would then think God's thoughts after Him. So, so, so that no matter in what area of life we're, we're dealing with, we, we don't want to think, well, well, is that the way that I would do it? Is that the way that uh, I feel about things? But instead, God, what do you have to say about this? And what we're going to be doing over the next two weeks as a church is we're going to be taking a little bit of a break from the Gospel of Luke. And, you know, every four years as a nation, um, we come to this time and this season where we have, as citizens of the United States, the ability to influence and to choose those who will govern us as a people. And that's no small thing. And the question that I want us to consider is, does God have any thoughts on that? Does God's word have anything to say to us about how we think about ourselves as Christians in relationship to the governments of the places where he has us live? And what you find when you come to God's word is that God does have some thoughts in it. And so that as we, as we look at this election cycle, as we look not just at this election cycle, but as we look to what comes after it, are we living, are we functioning in the world like God our Father would want us to? Or are we just simply going with the, with the flow? Are you following with me? Um, this is what I believe God would have for us today and next week. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. That passage that we heard read this morning is going to be the, the anchor text, if you will, for us um, this week as we consider, Lord, what do you have to say to us uh, about 
who we are as your sons and daughters in relationship then to the, the government and the institutions where we live. Uh, when we come to God's word, we discover he has a lot to say. And when you come to 1 Peter, we're going to pick it up in, in verse 11. And just to give you a real quick background, I love 1 Peter because it's written by the apostle Peter. And it's written to believers who are spread throughout the Roman Empire. And he's writing to them not only to remind them doctrinally of, of, of what Christ has done for them and, and who they are as Christians, but now how are they to live in light of those things. And so look at what he says here in chapter 2, verse 11. This is actually a transitional few verses because he's, he's leaving behind all the doctrine and theology that he's taught about. And now he's talking about how do we apply this in our lives. And he says this, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak of you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. What Peter does here is masterful. He is literally connecting what he has said before and preparing us for what he's about to say. He starts in these verses by, by speaking to us as the church. And he says that there are a couple things that as the church you need to be reminded of about yourselves. And the first thing that he says, look at verse 11, is he calls those that he's writing to what? Beloved. He writes them and he says, beloved. And, and, and when he uses that, this isn't a pet nickname that Peter had for the believers there that he's writing to. It's not like me calling Hannah Snookums, right? You know, it's like, by the way, if I called her Snookums, she would rightly probably slap me. Like, that's not, but this isn't a nickname, right? She, he's not coming and he's not saying, he's like, oh, beloved. No, he's anchoring them in this word to an identity that they have. The believers, you and I, who are in Jesus Christ, are those who have been loved by God. Can I get an amen to that? Greater love is no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. We see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the love of Christ controls us. God has shown his love upon you in ways that you could never even imagine. He has sought your good even at great cost to himself. We love because he first loved who? Us. We are those who have been loved by God. Now, it's just not intended to make us feel good. This statement that we are the beloved is to remind us of a part of our identity, and that is we are members of God's family. Because nowhere does God call people beloved except those who are members of his family. He is the father who loves the son, and because he loves the son, he loves those who are in his son. This is actually Peter doing a little thing here where he's like to call us beloved, like God doesn't just throw that around. The only people who are ever called God's beloved are those who are part of his family. So however we're to view ourselves as members of the church, it is those who are loved by God and part of his family. But then he doesn't just stop there. He reminds us of another part of our identity, who we are as the church, and he uses these two words. We are sojourners and what? Exiles. When was the last time you threw around the word sojourner, right? We don't do it that often. But actually, these two words are, are there to refer to one thing. You see, that word sojourner, it is used in the Greek to refer to someone who is not the citizen of a country in which they are living. And so when he calls us sojourners and exiles, he's saying you are a people who do not have citizenship in the place where you are currently living. And, and now, now, here's the deal. Like, some of these people are citizens of the Roman Empire at the time. So what's he talking about? He's talking about this very simple fact. We are citizens of God's kingdom. We are not citizens of this earth. Our primary identity is not citizens of the United States of America or citizens of the Roman Empire. No, no. He says, however you view yourself, it's, at a, it's as a citizen of God's kingdom. In just a month, I'm going to be over in Turkey and I'm going to be in Greece. And while I'm there, I'm going to travel there and I'm going to carry a piece of paper with me. It's known as my what? My passport. And that identifies to the people of the city that I'm in or the country that I'm in that I'm a citizen of the United States of America, right? That's, and so I'm in Turkey. They're not thinking, oh, this is a citizen of, of Turkey. They're not thinking, oh, this is a citizen of Greece. No, I'm a citizen of the United States. And when I'm there, there are certain rights and things that I do not have because that's not the place of my citizenship. It's not my home. And 
And Peter's saying, listen, you are members of God's family. He is your father. You are citizens of heaven. You belong to him. Jesus Christ is your king. This is who you are. He's anchoring us in this identity. And notice one final thing is that he tells us that because this is who we are, it impacts how we live. Look at the verses again back in verse 11. I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as, what's that word? Evil doers, remember that, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. We're members of God's family. We're citizens of his kingdom, which means we do not live by the values and standards of this world. Can I get an amen to that? That's what Peter's saying there. If you understand who you are, the values and standards of this world are not the values and standards by which you live. You've been freed from the domain of darkness. So the passions of the flesh, they don't control you anymore. But then he says something, and and you and I really need to see this. If Christ is your king and you're a member of his family and you want to live according to the way that God has called his people to live, do you notice what he says in the text? You and I need to be prepared for something. As you look to live as God calls you to live, the world at times will look at what you're doing, which is good and right according to God and his ways, but they will speak of you as what? Evildoers. I mean, that's insane. God, the ultimate lawgiver, says here's what's good and right and you and I will walk in obedience and faithfulness to that and yet the world will look at the standards and values of our King Jesus and they'll actually say that we're what? Evil. That we're doing evil. And I'm here to tell you that even today, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, the culture in which we live is already begun making huge movements in that direction. I mean, this is like before us even now, if you and I just simply want to follow what God's word says and such things as like one is only biologically a man and biologically female, we're only male and female, that's how God has created us. And you are who you are born to be, that that's God's plan and that, and that I don't get to choose my gender, that's something that's established by God because he says there's only male and there's only female. To just simply say that that's what God's word says. Our culture today says you are transphobic. You are evil for not allowing a person to pick the gender that they feel that they are. How shameful is that? That's what the world says about us. Well, not about us, because really what they're saying, that's about God and his ways. All we're trying to do is live that out. When we come and we say, listen, according to God, uh, marriage is between a man and between a woman. That's God's design and that's right and good. Our government today says that no, that's not what marriage is, that it can be between a man and a man and a woman and a woman. We just say, well, God's word says that this is what, what marriage is. And when we just simply try and say that that's what it is, guess what? The culture comes and says, you're what? You're evil. How dare you say that I can't love who I want to love? I'm like, I'm not saying anything. I have no authority. I'm just trying to follow my king and his name is is Jesus. Are you tracking with me? And so this is already being lived out. And yet what Peter comes and he says is this. He says, listen, he says, I want you to know your identity. And I want you to know that as you live that out, you aren't to live according to the standards and values of this world. And just be prepared and don't be ignorant and don't be surprised that when you do, People aren't necessarily going to like it. Now, with all of that said, you could see how if you were one of the first people reading this, you could begin to think, well, wait a second then. Okay, if that's how the world's going to treat me, and if I'm a member of God's family, if that's what my real family is, and, and if I'm a citizen of God's kingdom, then, then the question would be this. If God is my father, if my citizenship is in his kingdom, if my conduct should be different than that of the world, what responsibility, if any, do I have to the authorities and institutions that exist around me, right? Like you could naturally go there. If Christ is king, if God's my father, if the world's not gonna, you know, value the way that I'm looking to live my life, then, then you know what? I don't give a rip about them. <laughs> like what what role and responsibility do I have to the, to the government? I mean, Christ is my king. Or really to any institution. I mean, you could say that it's like, well, if God's my father, then what, who cares about what the church says or what my, or what my earthly father says? And, 
in God's great wisdom, it's as though Peter knows that exactly this is where we could go in our hearts and minds. That he like literally anticipates this because he immediately comes in verse 13 and look at what he says. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. What, what Peter does here is so masterful. After he has laid down these great theological truths that really anchor our souls in our identity, he comes and says, while it is true that God's your father, that you're citizens of his kingdom, do not fall, church, into the trap of thinking that you have no responsibility or relationship to the world around you. We don't want to fall into that trap. Peter, in these verses, he's trying to guard us, and even the verses that come after it, from thinking, well, my citizenship is with God, so, so who gives a rip about government? Who gives a rip about the state and its role in my life? Instead, he comes and he speaks very clearly to us. And one of the first things that he speaks very clearly to us, if you look in this passage, is about the state, it, about government itself. And he says some really powerful things here that are going to, I think, help us. You want to think God's thoughts after him about government? Well, you got to hear what God says here. And one of the first things that we see in this passage is that he says, every government is established by God. Every government that exists is established by, by God. We can't go about in this world thinking that government and governments are a human institution, are a human creation, are a thing that we came up with to simply control people. I mean, other people might say that, but as a Christian, we can't say that. And, and why can't we say that? Where do we actually see, Dave, in this text, God telling us this? And I say, well, thank you so much for asking. Let me show you. <laughs> Look at verse 13. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Well, there you go, Dave. It's a human institution. Wait for it. Whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by who? Him. You know who the him is there? God. It's God who sends the emperors. It's God who sends the governors. These that exist in the world have been sent by him. And where Peter says this kind of broadly, Paul gets very specific. If you were to turn in your Bibles to Romans 13, verses 1 through 2, you discover this. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. So where does the authority come from? God. And those that exist, those that do exist, have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur what? Judgment. Government is God's idea, not ours. And the governments that are in place in the world, whether you like them or not, have been instituted by God. There are things sometimes that show up in my house, and I'm like, where did this come from? Who, who, who brought this here? Why do, we, why do we even have this thing, right? God's not up in heaven during the American Revolution being like, what's going on in America? What's happened with, I thought the British were ruling those people, right? It's like when Hitler came to power, he's not surprised. When Russia fell apart, he wasn't surprised. Governments that exist in the world exist because God has ordained them to be there and, and they're gonna see as we, in just a moment, they have a role and a purpose. In fact, one of the most shocking passages that talks about this to me is actually John chapter 19, verse 11. When Jesus is on trial, before he goes to the cross, he's, he's going before the governing officials at that time. One of them is the governor, Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate is like, don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I can do to you? And Jesus says these words in John 19, 11. Jesus answered him, 
You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Jesus, God in the flesh, stands before Pilate and he says some incredible things. First, he affirms, Pilate, you're in the position that you're in because God placed you there. The authority that you have is because God gave it to you. But here's the part of the verse that you often will miss. Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Yet while he was on earth, he stands before Pilate and he says, as long as I'm here, you have authority over me. Does he say that Pilate doesn't have authority over him? No. He says, the authority that you have over me as a human being living in Judea, living in this time, is because God gave it to you. So Jesus is like, don't you know who I am, the King of kings and Lord of lords? You ain't got nothing to tell me. He says, no, I'm respecting the authority that you have been given because he knows where it comes from. So if Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, is recognizing the authority structures, I think if we want to think God's thoughts after him, we need to do the same, which is why Peter says what he does, why Paul says what he does as well. Now, here's something that I find interesting, though. While governments have been established by God, one of the things that you won't find, this is just a side note, this one's for free. (laughs) There is no form of government that God prescribes. What I mean by that is there are a lot of different forms that governments take in the world. Some that we like, some that we don't. Here in America, we have our democratic republic and we function in the way that we function. We got the three branches of government. You're not gonna find anywhere in scripture God coming and saying, here's the form of government that I want to see governing in a specific nation. We can look at God's word and we can ascertain principles about how, you know, how a government could ultimately govern best In fact, if you were to say that God were to prescribe one form of government, you know which is the one that it would seem that he would prescribe? Monarchy, (laughs) right? I mean, that's the one that you see most often that he even gave to his his people to govern. And how many of you just want to sign up for that plan, right? Like, we're Americans, no. But, you know, (laughs) so I'm just, as we look at the scripture, we want to be very careful as we think about that, that while God prescribes government, it's part of his plan for the world, He also doesn't come and say, well, this is exactly what it needs to be. No, I think that there's wisdom that can be applied. But we just want to keep that in mind. Even our founding fathers, if you read any history at all, they said, listen, we like what we've done here, but this only works if the people who are being governed and the lawgivers who are governing acknowledge that there's an ultimate lawgiver. (laughs) And they're like, this whole democracy thing crumbles without that. But notice... It doesn't just simply come here and tell us what the, that governments exist. Peter goes out of his way to say something about actually the function of governments, that they're supposed to perform a certain roles and responsibility. Look at what he says. Be subject to, go, to every human institution as sent by him. Look at what it says. To punish those who do evil and praise those who do what? Good. All right, governments, they exist in the world and they've been given a role and a responsibility. Peter says it's to punish evil and to celebrate to reward what is good. Paul says in Romans 13, 1 through 2, the exact same thing. Therefore, whoever resists authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. You see, God established governments to punish evil and celebrate those who do good. Government has a role and it has a function. He establishes it. They exist in the world. They're not surprised by him. And he established them because this is what a government's supposed to do. Punish evil, praise those who do good. Now, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that a government that's going to function best, a government that's ultimately going to thrive, is a government that knows what good and evil is. Can I get an amen to that? If this is what a government's supposed to do, then a government it needs to know what is good and what is evil. And the only way that a government can know that is by looking to God as the ultimate lawgiver. And so a government that acknowledges God and that he is the ultimate lawgiver will 
best govern according to God's design. And, and so when we think about this, this is huge for us. This shapes our thinking about government. Like, why do they exist? What are their purposes? Are they to take care of us? Or are they to, to provide for us? God's word comes here and it says, this is what a government's supposed to do. And this gives me an opportunity, church, to remind us of something and actually maybe introduce some of you to something that the Bible teaches. And in fact... Peter does it here, and it's this little thing called sphere sovereignty. Sphere sovereignty is a really kind of, I think, helpful theological category to describe something that the Bible teaches. And see, here's what sphere sovereignty is at its most basic level. It's this teaching that God has established different authority structures in the world. That there are different authority structures instituted by God that exist in the world. Peter, in 1 Peter, actually addresses four of them. The government, the family, the church, and, and the workplace. That there are these spheres in life where you and I exist, where there are these authority structures that aren't outside of God's design, but are actually a part of it. And the one that he's wrestling through here is the role of the government in the life of the Christian and when you think about these different spheres, it's important for us to know this. Each sphere is first and foremost under the authority of God. It serves a role and it is to respect the other spheres. And I'll explain that in just a minute. We've already talked about that they're established by God. The family's established by God. The church established by God. The government established by God. Work is established by, by God. And each of these spheres has a role. We just talked about the role of the government, right? It's to punish evil and to celebrate those that are what? Good. This is the role of the government. But one of the things that you don't want to lose sight of is that each of these different spheres, it's supposed to respect the other sphere. And so what I mean by that is the church, for instance. The church, we get to proclaim who our God is, how he's designed the world to be, and what is right and wrong according to his word. Like we have his word and we communicate that. But the church does not bear the sword and punish the evildoer. Are you tracking with me? The church's role in the world is not to go out and say, here's right and wrong. And if you don't do it, you're going to get killed. That's not what we do. In the same way, the church has a responsibility to proclaim God's word, especially to parents about how God says they are to, to live and to parent their children, but it's not the church's responsibility to raise your child. It's also not the government's responsibility to raise your child. When these spheres cross over, when the church picks up the sword, you begin to have problems. When a father says, we don't need the church, we just need our family, that's a problem. When you have government step in and says, let me tell you how to raise your children, that's a problem. You're supposed to respect the different spheres and stay in your lane, if you will. You know, illustrations of this, you know, happened, you know, not all that long ago during the COVID pandemic. You know, we had the government step in and begin to say things and begin to intervene. And its sphere of sovereignty began to encroach upon the family. It began to encroach upon the church. Like, it's all right and good for the government to be able to come and to say, hey, you know what, um, you know, th these are certain things that we don't think you should do. We're worried about the COVID virus and all those kind of things. But to tell the church, yeah, you can gather, but you can only have 15 people and you can't sing hymns, but you can pray and all those kind of things. Like, listen, it's not the government's role to involve itself in the doctrine and polity and practice of the church. Can I get an amen to that? Okay. You know, one of the crazy things that people forget is that when communist Russia was in full swing, Christianity was never banned in communist Russia. We used to think about the communists and how bad they were and, and you, know, oh, you know, Christianity can't exist in Russia. It couldn't exist in Russia. It was allowed to exist. There was a church in Russia at the time. It was allowed to exist as long as it did, a, guess what? Exactly what the Russian government said it could do and not do. And that's an overreach. Even today in communist China, Christianity is not illegal. There are Christian churches in China that are freely worshiping on a Sunday morning, but guess what? 
They have to do and meet and say and not say the things that the Communist Party in China says that they can do. That's fierce sovereignty integration, and that's messed up. That's not the way it's supposed to be. So when we think about government, we can be clear on this. We can know the role of government. We understand it's there to punish the evildoer and to celebrate which, that which is good. And now, I was going to save this. By the way, I'm going long today, so just buckle up. Like, you can see it in your notes. I got two pages. Like, what are we going to do, right? <clears throat> you're like, and right now, you're like, oh, no, no, stay with me. Come on now. Here we go. When you, when you think about this now biblically, now I'm speaking to the church family here for, for a moment here. We know our identity. We know who we are. We know the role of government. I'm just going to right now give an application. I was going to give it at the end, but you won't remember it by then, so let's do it now. When we know the role of government, think about how that impacts how we engage our government. We live in a country where we, as citizens of the United States, and then as Christians, have the ability to vote for and influence those who would serve to govern this nation. And we know that a government that functions best is a government that knows right from wrong. And so we live in a place where we can actually speak into the governing of our nation through the right that at this time we have to vote. Now, not every nation has that ability, but we do. And I'm not going to say to vote or to not vote is a sin, but what I am going to say is, as we live in the place where we live, we know the, what the role that government should have. And we, and we know what God wants for the governments where we live. And you and I have the ability to actually vote and speak into how our nation is governed. What a privilege. And so, so knowing that, we have this great opportunity every time an election runs around to say, you know what, as the people of God, I want to I wanna see this government where I live best function according to God's design and plan. And so I want to take advantage of what's been given to me. And, and, and so then what we want to do is we want to take the word of God with us. And we want to start where God's word is clear. Like, like what does God's word say is absolutely good and what is, what is wrong? And we want to look at the policies of the politicians and the parties that we're voting for. And we should look with, it, with, with the lens of God's word and say, which of these policies, which of these politicians and what they support do they clearly affirm the things that God says is good? And do they clearly condemn the things that God says is evil? And so when we think about using the freedoms that we have here, we come and we say, you know, we don't want to start first and foremost with like fiscal policy or even immigration policy. Like you could, you could do that, but you want to say like, let's just be clear. Which of these candidates that stands before me? Which of these parties that stands before me? Do they understand? Are they going to affirm that which is good or, or that which is evil? I mean, when, let's go back to one of the obvious ones I talked about earlier. It's like we know that marriage is between a man and between a woman, that that's God's design and that is good. And to go against that is not going to lead to society thriving, but it's going to lead to its tearing apart. Which party? Which politician? Are they affirming that which is good or are they celebrating the evil? When they, when they looks at the matter of life, murder is wrong. And so how do we think about when we vote? That's why pro-life things have been such an issue for so long because it's one of those things that seems like very clear in God's word. And so when we look at these parties, when we look at these politicians, I'm not telling you who to vote for. God's word is clear on what is good and what is evil. And you, and you should take that when you have the freedom to do so. One day that freedom might not be there. We have brothers and sisters around the world who don't have one iota of an ability to speak into their governments, but we do. And if we do, God help us to, to be able to use the freedoms that we have to support the way that God wants governments to function, amen? amen. Now, now, what happens though if, if we don't have those freedoms or if we're living in a place where, where ultimately our leaders aren't exactly who we'd want them to be. Well, let's get to that now because the text says it very clearly. This is the part where you want to tune me out. <laughs> be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do evil good. Paul, Peter says it here, 
be subject. Paul says it in Romans 13, 1. Let every person be subject to governing authorities. There is this overarching principle that comes and says, you can know what a government is and how it's supposed to function, but here's how you're to relate to it. Remember the question at the very beginning? Do I have any responsibility or relationship with my government? Peter says, Paul says, Jesus says, be subject to it. Now, what does it mean to be subject? Fortunately for us, Peter literally uses this word three times in reference to three different spheres. Be subject to governing authorities. Wives, be subject to your husbands. Servants, be subject to your masters. And when we think about this word, be subject, some translations have it as submit to. It can be one of those words that, that carries with us the idea of kind of like cowering in the shadows of somebody who's being oppressed and who has no choice in the matter, but that they just, they have to do this thing. Now, I will say, Peter says here, Paul says here, be subject. And every time they say it, it is a command. So it's not a suggestion. We are commanded to be subject, but what does it ultimately mean? Well, if you notice down in verse 16, Peter literally says that we're free people. Live as people who are free. Wait a second. Live as people who are free or be subject. Which one is it? Can you be free and be subject? Yes. Because what he's saying here is this. To be subject means that you actually have a choice. You're in a position of freedom, but when you are being subject, here's what it means. I'm going to use it in reference to government. We allow ourselves to be governed by our government. You are allowing yourself to be governed. To be subject to says, I know I'm free. I know Christ is my king. I know God is my father. But when it comes to this authority structure, just as I see with Jesus, I'm going to allow myself to be governed. I'm going to accept the authority that is over me. And when you think about what that actually means in practice, I think that's an important thing. In practice, at minimum, it means that we're going to listen to and we're going to follow the laws instituted by those authorities. We follow the laws established by our government. We we look at those things. Now, I'm going to get to, does that mean that we follow every single law? Because some of you as these red-blooded Americans who are independent are already thinking that, right? But, But in broadly speaking, to allow yourself to be governed says, The government is going to institute laws. It's going to institute guidelines. It's going to institute things that I'm going to follow. So when the speed limit says it's 55, I'm going to follow those things. When they say I need to pay these taxes, even though I don't like the percentage that they're taxing me with, I'm going to to do that. I'm going to allow myself to be governed. And as I said earlier, God doesn't just prescribe one form of government. So this doesn't mean that it's like, well, only if they're governing this way or, you know, if only it's a democratic republic, not if it's communists or socialism, that's, those, this is, no, no, no. Listen, when Peter wrote these words, the person who was governing, the emperor who was emperoring at that time was Nero. Yeah, for those of you who know your history, He's a bad dude. He's a whack job at best. He's oppressive. His taxation policies, I mean, just his taxation of his people were oppressive and burdensome. He was often unjust in how he responded. And so Peter's not writing this in a vacuum. He knows when he's saying be subject. He knows what he's saying. Now, Some of you are wondering, so do we always have to agree with, do we always have to obey our government officials? Is that what what we're saying? Is that when we say we're allowing ourselves to be governed, that we're going to follow the laws? The short answer to this is, is no. This does not mean that there aren't exceptions to this. When Peter says be subject to the governing authorities, there are clear teachings in the Word of God, church, of times when, listen to me carefully, we must obey. There are times where the government can come and give instructions with things that we don't agree with, but they're not moral issues. And and we can say, I don't necessarily like it, but I'm going to go along with it because I'm going to be subject to. But then there are times where the government's going to command things and we must disobey. And here's when those times are. When the government forbids something that God commands, we must disobey the government. When the government comes to us, the exceptions to this rule, if you will, are when the government says, you need to do this thing, 
or you must not do this thing, and God commands us to do it. We must disobey. And one of the examples of it is the very man who wrote this letter, Peter. When Jesus went up, back up into heaven, he told his disciples, go and make disciples of all the nations. He said, go to Jerusalem and to Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth preaching the gospel. And guess what the first apostles did? They did it. They started in Jerusalem and they started preaching. They went to the temple and they preached to the Jewish people. And as they preached, the government officials said, stop it. And then they kept on preaching. And then they said, stop it again. And they threw Peter and others in prison. And in the night, Acts 4 tells us, the, the, the prison doors flew open. Guess what Peter and the apostles did? They went back out. The next day, they were preaching again at the temple. And so a third time, the religious leaders sent people to go bring Peter and the others to them. They looked at Peter, and they looked at the disciples, and they said, we told you not to preach about Jesus. We told you that. And then you went out and you did it again. And in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, it says this, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey who? God rather than man. You are saying that we can't do something that God commands us to do. And so we must disobey. So when the government forbids something that God commands, we must disobey. And when the government commands something that God forbids, we must also disobey. Examples of the government commanding something that God forbids is found in, in Daniel. When Daniel's friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are told to worship the golden statue that was created by Nebuchadnezzar, that they and everyone else, when the horns and the sounds blow, that they're supposed to bow down and worship the statue, and if they don't, they'll die. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they do not bow down to the statue because they know that you shall worship what? The Lord your God and him alone. We can't bow down to your statue. You're commanding us to do it. And so they get thrown into the furry, fiery furnace. God spares their life. He preserves their life. But before they're thrown in, they say to Nebuchadnezzar, listen, you can kill us if you want, but our ultimate responsibility is to our God. Later on in the book of Daniel, Daniel himself is faced with a similar situation. King Darius is tricked into basically getting and, and making an edict where everyone is commanded to pray only to Darius for 30 days. And Daniel's like, I can't pray to Darius. I have to pray to my God. And so guess what he does? He goes back to praying for his God and he's caught doing it. And so he's thrown into the lion's den and yet God again rescues him. Church... We are to be subject to governing authorities. We're to allow ourselves to be governed. If the government tells us to do something that God forbids, then we must disobey. If the government tells us that we have to not do something that God commands, we can disobey. In fact, we must. And so it's because the government has got out, outside of its sphere. It's, it's not doing what God has called it to do. But I want to leave you with, with this. There's something, though, that, that here Peter talks about and that we see elsewhere. Church, if we ever get to the point where we must disobey governing authorities, we do so in a way that reflects Jesus Christ. If we're going to do this, we must do it in a way that reflects Jesus Christ. It's just actually right there in the text. He says, listen, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. And when you drop down into 1 Peter chapter 2, after he talks about masters and servants, look at what he says in, in verse 20. What credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Verse 22. When he was treated wrongly, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his what? mouth. Listen, if we're going to disobey, if we're going to get to that place where we're not going to respond to the government, what leads and guides us in that moment? What is, what's God's thoughts about that? What it means, according to this text, is we have to live like Jesus did in response. And every time you see the people of God disobeying a government according to what God calls them to, they never get violent, they never curse people, they never respond in anger, and lastly, guess what? They take the consequences. 
When we must disobey governing and authorities, we must accept the consequences. As we look to live like Jesus, it's not that we don't disobey, we do. But when we do, we can't then raise up the sword. We can't then go after and kill the people who are, who are put in that position. We don't respond to violence with violence. If you go back to Romans, it says that when a government does what it does, the ultimate avenger of God's people is guess who? God. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. I do not have to make a government pay for the way that it's treating me because every person is accountable before the judgment seat of God. Does that make it easy? (laughs) Will that make it painless? No. But this is how we're called to respond. In our obedience and disobedience to the government, we conduct ourselves in such a way that the message of Jesus Christ is never distorted. May that always be in our minds and on our hearts and on our lips. It's why Peter closes this whole section with these words. He comes and he says that we are to honor the emperor. Look at how the whole thing ends. Honor everyone Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. The last point in your notes is this. We honor those who govern us. As we look to allow ourselves to be governed, the final thing for us to know is that as as we live in this world, yes, we exercise our rights and our freedoms and the places that we live to look to influence, but as we go about, the primary consideration that Peter has, that Paul has, that God has for you is that you live your life in such a way in the places that you live that display Jesus Christ. And that means honoring the emperor. And church, one more time, who was the emperor while Peter was writing these things? It was Nero. Do you think that that was a man that you would look to, that you would point your children to and say, live like Nero, he's a good guy? No, not for one moment. And yet he says we honor him. And so what does this ultimately look like in practice? What will it look like for us to honor our government officials? Well, one of the things is actually something that we're doing tonight. We're coming again tonight at 6.30 and we're praying for our nation. I'm going to talk more about this next week. But we get to pray for our leaders. We get to honor them by praying for them in the roles that God has given them. But secondly, and I think this is the most important, we honor our leaders with our speech. We honor our leaders with our speech. When people hear us as Christians talk about our government leaders, do they hear Jesus? Just because you don't like a certain person of a certain political party does not give you the right to slander them as an image bearer made in God's image. Just because you don't like a certain political opponent doesn't mean that you get to gossip about them with other people. I am as guilty of this as anyone, but somehow for us as Christians and as the church, we sometimes seem to say, I can speak this way, holy and righteous and praising God with my tongue in church, but when I get out of church and I start talking politics, I can say anything I want, I can post anything I want about government officials. One of the things that we should be thinking this election season, not just simply as we go to vote, but as we go about our lives in the world, is to think God's thoughts after him and to think, are the things that I'm saying about this person, are they things that would be qualified as honoring or are they dishonoring? And I know that some of our opponents and some of their policies are actually sinful. And it's not that we don't call out sin when we see it, but when we speak about sin, there must be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and you know what the last one is? Self-control. May we engage our government, may we talk about politics in such a way that it is shown to the world that Christ is our King and our Father because we display it in our character. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we call upon you in this time 
Because, Lord, we want, we want to reflect you. You have saved us. You have redeemed us. You have made us your own, Lord. We started with that this morning. We're ending with that this morning. Lord, our hearts need to hear it. But, Lord, help us not to just have that be something that takes place on Sunday mornings in this room, but something that carries with us as we go out into the world, realizing that according to your design, we live where we live. We're governed by who we're governed by. And that, Lord, you give us the opportunity to actually live out the character of Christ in those areas. And so, Lord, we want to. We want to be governed well. We want to use the freedoms we have to, to influence those who govern us, that it would be according to your word. We want to speak about these things, Lord, not out of the flesh and the passions of our flesh, but out of the love of Christ and the holiness and the righteousness that was purchased for us by Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And so, Lord, may your spirit do that mighty work in us as we go forward to the praise and glory of your name. And all God's people said, amen, amen.